All right, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to the book of Luke, um, chapter 24, verses 18, Luke 24, 18, and I'm also going to be reading um, verses 25 through 27, so I will turn there with you, Luke chapter 24. And this story, um, if you've read it before, it's called The Road to Emmaus. And this is the backdrop of my message today. It's a story of two people who are on their way to a town called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And I really want you to pay attention to this story and and to try to place yourself in the story, right? Right? Uh, when I'm reading scripture, I often do that. I try to, to put myself in the story and to ask myself, Jesus, what is your message for me? The name of my message today is called Always There, Seeing Jesus in Life's Blinding Storms. You know, whether we say it out loud or not, I think as, as people who encounter hardships and and unforeseen circumstances in life, one of the things we say either verbally or non-verbally, at least one of the things that I often find myself saying is, Jesus, are you actually there? Because he's not this physical God that we can like reach out and like touch physically. And so it's real easy to see Jesus when everything in life seems to be connecting and adding up, but it's much harder to see him, right? when the challenges of life come our way. And so the things we face in life cause us to question if Jesus is there. And the reality is that life doesn't always go as we plan it. Life's constantly changing. It's constantly uh, uh, moving in different directions. Things are constantly popping up, both good and bad. And and in that turmoil and in that, that tension, sometimes it fogs our vision And we don't know or we don't see that Jesus is still there. But I want to encourage somebody today that by the end of this message, that you know that Jesus is always there because he promised to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. When things are good, it's easier to see Jesus. However, when things are challenging, like When they're challenging for me, I question Jesus's presence and purpose in my life. If you have or are currently having a tough time seeing Jesus actively at work in your life, I want to encourage somebody today. You're not alone. There is likely somebody else in this room who's having a difficult time seeing Jesus. And there are certainly people in scripture who had a difficult time seeing Jesus. People who we would think are the greatest men of God, the greatest women of God. I mean, I can go down the line and and just share people's names in scripture who are like, like Jesus, God, are you actually there for me? These are people who did great miracles. These are people that we preach about every Sunday. And yet even in their vulnerability, they ask the question, God, are you there Today, we're going to focus on two people, though, who are blinded from seeing Jesus during a challenging moment of their life. A little backdrop to today's story. Bible scholars believe that these two people were Cleopas, that's Jesus's uncle, and Cleopas's wife named Mary. Mary was one of the women at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. This was the third day, two days after Jesus was crucified. They had gone to Jerusalem and now they were on their way back to this town called Emmaus. It was a seven mile walk. They were, the scripture says that this couple was, uh, the actual translation says, I love it. They were throwing words at each other. What does that sound like? They were fighting. They were arguing about the, the things that they thought would transpire. They were, they were arguing about like, well, didn't Jesus say this was, was, was going to happen? And now it's the third day and we went to his tomb and he's not there. They were literally having an argument on the road to Emmaus. And this is where our story picks up. And there's a man named Jesus who walks up to them. But scripture says they did not see him. 
but it was him. So our story picks up in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was... He who was going to redeem Israel, indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Down to verse 25. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus walks up. They don't see him, but he's there. And they're blind to Jesus. How many of us are often blind to Jesus? He's there, but we don't see him. He's walking with us, but we feel alone. We're confused, but he's there to bring clarity. Scripture says that Jesus is a present help in our time of need. Present, available, there, always there. Jesus is not trying to hide himself from us. In fact, I would argue quite the opposite, that Jesus is passionately pursuing you today passionately pursuing you today. Do you know that you can never out-pursue Jesus? There is nothing that you can do that would out-pursue his love for you. When you look through scripture, the entirety of scripture, almost every biblical character, Jesus is pursuing them. God is pursuing them, whether they're pursuing him or not. In fact, you see Jesus pursuing people in their most vulnerable state, even in moments when they have fallen short and sinned against him. Jesus is still pursuing them. God is still pursuing them. Why? Because God, our God, is in the restoration business. Our God is in the clarity business. Our God is in the business of bringing healing and strength and joy and recovery. God doesn't want you to suffer. God wants to strengthen you. He wants to heal you. He wants to give you vision when you lack it. That is the heart of our Father. That is the gospel. That is the good news. I want to encourage you as you study scripture, see it through that lens. Who is pursuing who? Because more times than not, it's Jesus pursuing us, not us pursuing him. It's always him. He is the initiator of this relationship, not us. Like they were saying, before we were yet sinners, Christ sent his son to die for us. Before he was even a thought, he was pursuing us. He was actively pursuing us. Now, I want to talk about the difference between physical and, and spiritual sight, because when, it, when I'm talking about seeing Jesus, the reality is not all of us are seeing Jesus physically every day. If you are, that is amazing. That is so cool. Please tell me what he looks like, what he sounds like. I need to know. But, but the chances are we're not like, well, yeah, I, was, I just saw Jesus yesterday. Okay, But scripture says that we can see him. So what is it talking about? It's not talking about a physical sight. It's talking about a spiritual sight. And we need to understand that though we may not see Jesus physically, 
we have access to him spiritually. We can discern and know that he's there through the Holy Spirit. We can see him at work in, in our life and in the lives of other people. Look, there's a lot of things that we don't see that we believe. Okay, we connect to the Wi-Fi every day. When was the last time you saw the Wi-Fi? Please tell me what it looks like. Because I couldn't find it this morning when I was trying to print out my sermon and my printer went dead. I was like, honey, where is the Wi-Fi? Thank God I connected to it and I was able to print it. But I didn't see the Wi-Fi. The only indication of that Wi-Fi was when the light turned on my printer and it said connected. I said, oh, thank God there's Wi-Fi. You don't see the wind. Yet you feel it in this 103 degree San Antonio weather and you thank God for it, right? Oh, and I was at the river. I was like, oh, thank God for that wind. You don't see it, but you have faith in it. You believe that you can connect with it. It's more real than ever. And the same thing is true with Jesus. You may not see him. You can feel him. You can sense and discern and know that he's there. You can see him actively at work. In our everyday lives, just like the wind blows through the trees and the weaves and, and, the, and the leaves, you can hear of his goodness and his majesty. He's there. But you got you to gotta connect with him spiritually. Our connection to Jesus is not physical, but spiritual. I recently read a description that talks about the differences between the physical and and the spiritual, physical sight and spiritual sight. I want you to listen to this. The article said our physical eyes look out and away from us. Our spiritual eyes look in and toward Christ in us. Our spiritual eyes discern the flesh at work in us. Our spiritual eyes look toward who we are or can be in Christ. Seeing the spiritual in the midst of the physical involves responding to the Holy Spirit. He works to improve our spiritual vision and our spiritual hearing. Jesus promised not a, necessarily a physical sight, but a spiritual one. It's a spiritual sight. We connect with him spiritually. Before Jesus left the earth, he promised his early followers and those who would eventually follow us spiritual sight. It's a promise from him that we will not walk on this earth in blindness, spiritual blindness, but that we would see him. Look at John chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. This chapter in the book of John is talking about the Holy Spirit. Talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus, what did he say? It's better that I leave you because if I don't leave you, I can't send the helper. I can't send the counselor and the comforter, the Holy Spirit. So I got to get out. And when I get out, I'm going to send somebody. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. And yes, the Holy Spirit is, is powerful and, and mighty. And, and we experience the power of the Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage you, the Holy Spirit is also a personality. It's the personality of Jesus. It's our connection to Jesus and the Father, it's the Holy Spirit. So yes, he's powerful and he's mighty, but he's also gentle. He's also a comforter. He's also our friend. And Jesus, when talking about the Holy Spirit, said this. He said, before long, the world won't see me anymore. He said, but you will see me. There's a promise. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I, too, will love them and show myself to them. He said, I'll, you'll see me. The world won't see me, but you'll see me. I'm going to give you my word. You're going you're gonna to follow me. You're going to obey me. You're going you're gonna to walk in my will, and I'm going to love you. And guess what? I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal myself to you. Spiritual sight. So that you're not walking through this world blind, wondering, is everything going to be okay? No, there's this faith and assurance. There's this faith-filled vision that, you know what? If God is on my side, everything's going to be all right. If God is for me, who can be against me? 
There's this spiritual vision that says, hey, I may not see the full picture, but I know who's with me. And I know that he's working all things out for my good. A sure way to live spiritually blind, though, is to live your life apart from Jesus. When we disobey Jesus, when we, when we intentionally live our lives without him, it's a sure way to walk spiritually blind. I mean, life's already challenging enough. Why would you want to make it more challenging by saying, you know what, Jesus, I don't need you. I think my vision is good enough. No, we need him. Because apart from him, we are blind people aimlessly walking through this life, just trying to figure it out. But we need spiritual sight and spiritual vision, that spiritual discernment in the midst of the physical to close your eyes and to press in and to connect with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. That's the life that God has called us to. And he, he wants you to walk in that kind of life. To walk in that kind of vision. This is a key point because some people tend to blame God for not being there for them when they have made the decision to separate themselves from it. Well, I don't see, I never see God working in my life. I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. It's just a spiritual reality. When you are living your life in rebellion to God, these are not my words. This is a scripture. You will not be able to see him. You will not be able to sense him, discern him, and you will feel alone. But guess what? This is the good news. Jesus doesn't want that for you. People make that decision to, to separate themselves from Jesus. And that spiritual blinder, those spiritual blinders come over them. Jesus doesn't want that. Quite the opposite. When Jesus came, one of his focal missions, right? One of his main missions was to bring spiritual sight. That, that was like his, his declarative statement when he started his ministry and he opened up the scroll of Isaiah. He, he, he actually talked about bringing spiritual sight. Let me find it here in the book of Isaiah. Anyways, when Jesus opened up the, the, the book of Isaiah, right, one of the things he said was, is it there? Do I have it there? I don't know if I included it. He opens up the, the scroll of Isaiah and he says that he came to restore sight to the blindness, right? To deliver the captives, to, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And when you read that, you can think, well, Jesus just came to heal a bunch of blind people physically, even though he did that. But what he's talking about in Isaiah is a much deeper, uh, there's a deeper meaning to it. What Jesus was talking about was he came to bring spiritual sight to those who are spiritually blind. He said, I came to restore the sight of the blind to those who can't see me, those who can't discern me, those who don't realize that I'm there for them. I came to restore that sight. Jesus came to restore spiritual sight. I'm thinking it was in Isaiah, because he read Isaiah, but it was in Luke 4, 18 and 19. I think we should have it up there. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus stands up and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He closed the scroll of Isaiah and guess what? Started his earthly ministry. Right out of the gate, he says, one of my main missions is to bring sight to the blind. Spiritual sight. Not just physical sight. It was spiritual sight that he was talking about. Jesus not, does not want us to walk spiritually blind. His character is to restore sight and to reveal himself to those who do not, do not know him and to those who do not, do not see him. This message is both for the believer and the non-believer. Right? Certainly to the non-believer or the, the person who's in rebellion and sin to the Lord. There has to be reconciliation. There has to be repentance. 
But even as a Christian who is living out our faith, it can still be hard to see Jesus at times. And sometimes it's because there's just, there's, there's a need of a fresh connection. Because we've, we've focused on the physical more than connecting with Jesus in the spiritual. So this isn't like a, well, well you, if you're an unbeliever, this message is for you because you're blind. No, this message is for all of us. Because if you're like me as a believer, as I'm living out my faith, there are times where I need a fresh connection with Jesus. Where I'm like, Jesus, I need to experience you anew. I need to connect with you anew. I need that fresh spiritual discernment and vision and faith to believe that you're there. To trust in your process. To trust in your purpose and your will and your plan for my life. I wish I had more time to get into, uh, really unpack all this. Another great story and example to look to is Thomas. Around the same time that Jesus died, he appears to his disciple. Thomas missed the party. Jesus revealed himself to his disciples. And then Thomas shows up and he goes, oh, I'm late. They said, oh, dude, Jesus just appeared to us. We saw him physically. We saw him, Jesus. Uh, Thomas. Thomas is disgruntled. He's like that friend that just showed up late. Missed the whole party. They were packing it up rolling the chip bags up, putting the to-go boxes on. They were like, hey, party's done, bro. Oh, man, I'm sorry. 1604 traffic. <laughs> he was late. And guess what? Jesus appears the second time. And Thomas is there. And what does Thomas say? Is, is this real? Hold on. Is this really a sight issue or a faith issue? Is seeing Jesus really a sight issue or a faith issue? Because Jesus shows up again. He goes, here I am. And what did, what did Thomas tell the disciples? Unless Jesus shows up in person, I won't believe. I won't have faith unless I actually see him physically with my eyes. Jesus shows up. He says, hey, put your hand right here. Touch me. Touch the scars. See it? And then it says, and then Thomas believed. And Jesus said that he showed him his side so that he would believe. And then he tells Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen, but still believe. Blessed are those who have not seen. Bl blessed are the people that are sitting in limitless church who haven't touched me physically, who haven't seen me physically, but they still have the faith to know that I am king, that I am Lord, that I am savior. It wasn't a sight issue. It was a faith issue. If Thomas just would have had faith to believe the disciples that Jesus was alive and get off of his little pity potty, he would have believed that Jesus was alive. How do you see Jesus? It's not always going to be physical, but it needs to come by faith and the stories of how Jesus has worked in other people's lives. You got to learn to see him differently. You, you, you got to say, Jesus, help, help me to see you today. That's what's so great about community and being a part of a church like Limitless or whatever, whatever church you go to. Because, because in community, you see Jesus more clearly. In, in your life groups or your small groups or in, in, your, in your gatherings, what are you doing? You're hearing stories and testimonies about Jesus' faithfulness. And every time you hear it, you know what that does? It builds up faith in you. Wow. I do see Jesus. I do see Jesus at work in other people's lives. I do. People are saying that they see Jesus at work in my life. And you see him more clearly by faith and through the spirit. Luke 24, 15. Jesus does not want us to walk in spiritual blindness. His character is to restore sight and to reveal himself to those who do not know or see him. Back to our story. Consider our story once more. It says that they're walking and they're blind. And Jesus just has a way of interjecting himself into our lives. Jesus said, yo, what's up? What are y'all talking about? <laughs> it's, I love it. It's a great And they, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who's not heard about the things that have happened? 
I mean, like, like when Jesus died and all that, it was like headlines. It was like major story. Everybody knew about it. And then you have this guy who walks up, and he, it's like, hey, what's going on? They're like, you haven't heard anything about what's happened to Jesus the last couple of days? He's like, no, <laughs> tell me more. Literally, Jesus is like messing with them. They're like, well, we thought, you know, he said he was going to be the king, and, you know, we, we thought that, that, that he was going to be the king, and he was going to overthrow the Romans, and, like, now it's the third day, and we went to his tomb, and he's not even there. He's like, tell me more. Luke 24, 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. If there's anything this story teaches us is that Jesus wants to reveal himself to those who cannot see him. Amen. They didn't even ask, Jesus, can you? Jesus, it makes room for him. Amen. When you set your gaze upon him, it makes room for him. When you worship him, it makes room. When we were worshiping early, we were making room for him. They, they made room. They cultivated, they cultivated a, 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 an atmosphere that was conducive to Jesus. If you want to see Jesus more clearly, you need to cultivate the right atmosphere. Okay? You're not going to see Jesus hanging out with friends who aren't hanging out, that, 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 that aren't pursuing Jesus. Even though we're called to minister to them. You're not, not going to see Jesus in the club. You're, you're not going to see Jesus at the bottom, the, at the bottom of a, a, a liquor bottle. These are not the right atmospheres that are conducive for Jesus, though he will restore you and heal you and set you free from those things. He has a way of finding you. What, what I'm trying to express is that you have to cultivate the right atmosphere, right, for Jesus to find you. Your heart has to be prepared to see him more clearly. And he says, um, what we learn in this story is that Jesus was genuinely concerned for these two people. He walked with them. He asked them questions. He listened to them. He helped them to better understand their situation. And that's the same kind of relationship he wants to have with us. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to listen to your concerns and your fears and your questions. Like, he's not afraid of the things that you think about when you're driving home by yourself. When you lay your head down to sleep, all those thoughts that are, he's not afraid of those. The things you don't even share with your closest family member or friends, he's not afraid of those. In fact, he's like, I want to hear more. Let's go deeper into that. Let me hear your heart in that. And let me share my heart with you. That's, that's his nature. Jesus has a pattern of interjecting himself in people's lives at their worst state, not their best. One of the best ways to find clarity in your life is to turn to the word of God. If you're like, Jesus, I need to see you more, turn to the word of God. Do you know that Jesus, when he showed up in disguise and it says they couldn't see him, the thing that he turned to to reveal himself was actually the word? He, he, he was the word made flesh. He could have just went like, here I am. And just undisguised himself. But even Jesus turned to the scriptures to make himself known. Oh, that is such an important point because this thing right here. Oh, Jesus. This thing right here. This word is sufficient. This word, page by page, reveals the heart of Jesus for your life. This word has so many stories in it that will, that, will, that will cultivate the faith inside of you to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus didn't even set this aside. He's walking with them, and in Luke 24, 26, and 27... He says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Listen to this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
Right? We have the Bible now. They had Moses and the prophets. So that was like their Bible. That was their scriptures, their holy word. So they're walking on this seven mile journey and Jesus is like, hey, let's go back in the past and let me show you who I am. Let me show you how everything is pointing to me. Let me reveal everything concerning myself. He connected the past to the present and helped them to see him more clearly. How did he do it? He did it through the word. He did it through the scriptures. The scriptures are sufficient enough for us to see Jesus. You want to get a better picture of who Jesus is? Read your word. Read your words. Certainly read the Gospels and place yourself in those stories because he's the same God who, if he did it for them, he can do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. The same way that he worked back then, he can work in your life today. I'm going to invite the, the keyboardists up um, just as I prepare to, to close. I want to encourage somebody today that you're, if you're having a hard time seeing Jesus clearly, turn to the Word of God. And not only turn to the Word of God, but remind yourself of how He's been faithful to you. For some of you, you may say, I don't really have a history with Jesus. I, I've, I've never even really seen Him work in my life, so I, I don't really have a starting point. If you don't have a starting point to read scripture, listen to this, the ways that God is working in other people's lives. But if you, if you have a recollection of how Jesus has worked in your life, think about those things. Because in, in, in the blurriness and in the fog of life right now, it's hard to see him sometimes. But if you remind yourself of his faithfulness, it'll build up your faith so that you can see him more clearly today. How has he been faithful to you before? How has he been good to you before? How has he intervened in your life before? He's still that same God. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed his love for you. He hasn't changed his, the, the way that he sees you. He hasn't changed his promise to be there for you and to strengthen you and to heal you and to comfort you. Romans chapter 15, verse four says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Why do we even have these scriptures? So we can have hope. So that through every story we see Jesus. So that in the present, we're reminded of the past. We say, Jesus, I believe you can work that way again right now. Right now, today, Sunday at Limitless Church. I believe that you can still work in my life today. As I said earlier, I'm convinced that Jesus is pursuing us much harder than we could ever pursue him. I've been, I've been walking with the Lord seriously since 2008. And I'm more convinced today than ever that Jesus is passionately pursuing us. He's passionately pursuing me. I can't out pursue him. I just can't, I've tried, I can't. I can't out fast him. I can't out pray him. I can't out chase him. I just can't do it. I've tried. Like someone once told me, you know, I ran hard after Jesus and then I realized I can't keep up. He runs too hard. He's too good. He's too holy but I can make myself available to him. You don't achieve spiritual sight, you receive it. You don't achieve salvation, you receive it. You don't achieve righteousness, you receive it. It's all received. Everything we do as believers is not achieved, it's received. And when we receive it, then we achieve. Not about achieving, not about I'm gonna be a better Christian, I'm gonna fast more, gonna, even though God will honor all those things. It's about faith. Abraham believed it was a credit to him as righteousness before he ever even did anything. Before he circumcised his sons, before he offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the altar, before he did any of those things, it says he received, he believed, 
and it was a credit to him as righteousness. And he was a friend of God. God revealed himself to him. Our spiritual sight will not come by achieving more for Jesus. Instead, it comes by receiving him into your life and making room for him in your heart by faith. I close with this. Once Jesus arrived to Amos, it says that he acted like he was going to keep moving on. He was like, see you. They said, no, 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 no. No, come, come stay with us. I said, all right, I'll stay with you. He comes and stays with them and he sits down at the table. This would have been Sunday, right? It's been two days. It's the third day now. So it's communion Sunday. Hey. Jesus gives them bread. They're taking communion. Jesus blesses the bread and he gives it to them. Look what happens. Luke 14, 30 and 32. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Our hearts were burning on fire with every word that he said. And he opened their spiritual eyes that they might see him. I think that's such a beautiful picture of us accepting Jesus into our lives. That communion is just that intimate relationship that we have with him. And as we spend time with him and we talk with him and we listen to him and we, we, we spend time pursuing him together, we, we see him. Maybe not physically, but we know that he's there. Like in moments like this, where you're just like, Jesus, you're there. You're there for me. You're there for us. And I just want to encourage somebody today that, that he's here for you. He loves you so much. He's not trying to run away from you. He's passionately pursuing you. He wants to interject himself into your life like this, this guy that was disguised. He just wants to, hey, what's going on? He, just, he, he really, I mean, like, think about that to be there with you what's our response just to make room for him what does that room look like for some of you it's like receiving Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior you've never done that it has to start there if you've never accepted Jesus into your heart into your life if you've never said I'm so sorry for not for living my life apart from you and I, I, I want to start this relationship with you right now it has to start there but for some of you who've already made that decision maybe it's just a reconnection maybe maybe there's just been so much happening in your life that you're focused on the physical and you need a fresh spiritual connection 